Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Space Force Doctrine and Delivery Discussion with Major General Bill LaCorey, Colonel Casey Beard, and Major Kenny Groslin. I really appreciate everyone being here today, and thank you all so much for your time. Before we get started, I just want to thank our corporate members of the Space Force Association because it's their support that allows us to do what we do. So I'd like to thank Braxton Technologies, Boresight LLC, AGI, and Numerica. Thanks so much for your, your support as we help get the word out about what the Space Force is doing so that everyone knows that we are developing the world's premier Space Force. And again, thank you all so much for being here today. Before we get going, I'd like to just provide the audience just a quick understanding of your backgrounds. So General LaCorey, would you just mind telling the audience a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure, absolutely, Hippie. And, and thanks to you and the Space Force Association, as well as the corporate members that make this a reality. Um, it, it's, a, it's a critical role that you fill in, in getting the word out. And so we really appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you today about the doctrine document. Um, for those who I haven't met online, uh, my name is uh, Bill LaCorey. I'm a 29-year space operator, although I think the trail of recent assignments would indicate uh, more on the staff side. Um, but, uh, you know, the, I uh, commanded the uh, Space Ops Squadron at the Aerospace Data Facility in Colorado and then the 50th Space Wing and most recent two assignments. Uh, I was at the White House as the Director for Space Policy on the National Security Council staff, and then General Raymond hired me here uh, to be at the time the Air Force Space Command and now the headquarters U.S. Space Force um, S-59, so strategic requirements and analysis is probably the easiest way to, to refer to it. Great. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Colonel Beard, over to you, sir. Yeah, Hippie, uh, thanks again for the opportunity. And, and and ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I uh, wanted to echo General LaCorey's comments and gratitude for the, for the sponsors and, and the support uh, that we have from SFA. Uh, I'm really looking to, to continue the partnership with you all uh, and, and continue to get the message out on what the Space Force is and specifically the, the Capstone Doctrine. Um, so again, uh, for those that, that don't know me, a uh, quick background here. Um, uh, commissioned in 01 from Clemson University, Bleed Orange there, and uh, uh, jumped right into ICBM operations. Uh, new operations there, I worked Peacekeeper, uh, deactivated that system. I switched over to space in, uh, in 06, uh, had some exposure to MILSATCOM, new command and control working at uh, the 4th Space Operations Squadron. I uh, had an opportunity to, to go over to Nellis, and then after, uh, after a brief stint in Nellis, I uh, went into operational command and control at what was then the JSPOC, now the CSPOC, uh, out at Vandenberg, uh, and really got into op offensive defensive space control operations at that point. Um, had an opportunity to command at the squadron level, uh, the first space operations squadron, um, from 15 to 17 when uh, GSTAP first came online. We had a great, uh, great time there, a great team, uh, breaking, some, uh, breaking some ground on how to do uh, space-based characterization. Um, stint uh, right before where I am now, uh, I was at OSD Space Policy. I uh, had an opportunity to work with Dazzy, uh, Steve Kate and the team uh, from, uh, from 18 to, to just this summer, working the legislative proposal for the Space Force itself and had a great opportunity uh, to, to lead and be a part of the original writing team for SCP. Um, if we're able to talk about that, um, and, and which uh, Major Grosson is part of, and he'll, he'll maybe talk to that as well. And I'm currently now, uh, as of officially 24 July, the Space Delta Nine Commander uh, Orbital Warfare based out of Schriever uh, here in Colorado Springs. So thanks again. Yes, sir. And looking forward to future conversations with you about what Delta Nine is doing, so thank you for your time. Good. Major Groslin, over to you, sir. Awesome, well, it's always great to see you, uh, Colonel Wolf, and what an exciting platform to, to share this, this milestone. Um, so I'm Kenny Groslin, I am currently a student with the Secretary of Defense Strategic Thinkers Program out in DC. Um, I've been a, a space operator for 12 years now, um, I did um, assignments um, at the Rand Corporation and then at the 50th Space Wing doing MILSATCOM and then in the 3rd Space Experimentation Squadron and then I was at Headquarters Air Force Space Command um, back when things were a little simpler um, for everyone in the building um, but I'm excited to be here today and, and to discuss the, the doctrine. Thank you so much Major Grazman, I appreciate it. 
And Major General Corey, when is when is the date actually set for uh, pinning on three stars? Congratulations, by the way, on your promotion to Lieutenant General. Thank you. I appreciate it. Really uh, uh, an indicator of being blessed to uh, be a part of some really good teams from the start of my career all the way to through to now. Um, so the, uh, still a little TBD. I'm in the middle of PCS planning and household goods uh, shipment and things. I think a truck's going to show up at my house here uh, next week. So we're moving fast, but uh, we'll keep you posted. <laughs> yes, sir. And the new assignment, can you talk about the new assignment that you're going to briefly? Sure, I'll be one of uh, Chief Raymond's uh, leadership team on the uh, S staff at the Pentagon, specifically the Deputy Chief of Space Operations for Strategy Plans, Programs, Requirements, and Analysis. Wow, that's a mouthful. Sounds like you're, you're gonna have your plate full, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. And the last time, I mean, I remember working with you, one of my best days, I think, oh, memories of weapon school, if there is such a thing is sitting in class listening to all the space capabilities in a day-long session where Major LaCorey and Major Saltzman uh, proceeded to tell the class all about the different space capabilities we had. I, I just remember that day like it was yesterday and how, how you all tried to make it extremely lively and uh, it was just it was a lot of fun. And then working with Major Groslin, it was Captain Groslin at the time, I had been forced into the high-level cell, what was called the high-level cell at the Trevor War Game. And I remember General Buck had said, hey, he was 14th Air Force commander at the time in JFCC space. And he said, I'd like you to lead my high-level cell. And I said, yeah, it sounds good. But really what I want to focus on is I'd like the tacticians to stand up and tell us what we really need to do. And I remember turning to Captain Groslin and I said, is this something you'd be willing to do? And without hesitation, Kenny put a team together, and I think, well, my, my memory was it was a phenomenal session that we had, and it was an opportunity, I think, to let General Raymond know uh, how the tacticians can help inform uh, strategy. And that leads right into this doctrine document that is just one of the examples that allows us to now talk about the space capabilities the way they need to be spoken about, and then describe the types of effects that we can eventually have using the, the doctrinal concepts that you that you lay out. And so without, well, without further ado, General LaCorey, military doctrine frames the beliefs, principles, and best practices in order to shape the conduct of military action in the pursuit of national security objectives. The space capstone document, which is the foundation for all subsequent U.S. Space Force doctrine, the foundational beliefs and principles to shape U.S. Space Force thinking about and conduct of operations in, from, and to the space domain. Significant portions of the doctrine document are focused on defining national space power as compared to military space power. Why is the distinction between national and military space power is important? And how are the two concepts related, complementary, and what are the implications for the future U.S. Space Force acquisitions and operations? Sure, that's a, that's a great question, great place to start the dialogue. Um, but before I do, because I know I'll forget to do it later, this is a, a great time to uh, thank the two individuals I'm here with, uh, Major Groslin and Colonel Beard, uh, for their leadership of this uh, group of folks that uh, took it upon themselves on their own time uh, to wrestle with these ideas and to put forward a proposal uh, for this doctrine document. Uh, ultimately, 22 uh, individuals led by the two that are here with me today uh, across the Air Force, uh, other services, uh, officer, NCO, um, as well as civilians. Uh, and not only does the Space Force, but the nation owes this group uh, a debt of gratitude for putting us on the right path so early uh, in the Space Force uh, history. So again, thanks to both of you. Uh, it's been a pleasure working through uh, with you throughout my career, and, and you guys really just defined exactly what we've uh, come to know uh, and appreciate and value from both of you uh, in the leadership of this effort. Um, so uh, with that, military power, national space power. So two very uh, interrelated concepts and, and the team that was writing, and, and I'll let them uh, amplify uh, here in a second, but certainly saw the need to, in this capstone doctor, doctrine document, highlight the relationship between the two. You know, really the SCP itself, U.S. Space Command and the U.S. Space Force, um, all start with the recognition that space is a vital national interest uh, to our country. Um, 
And, you know, that got captured early on uh, in this administration in the National Strategy for Space, as well as the National Security Strategy, uh, and defined as um, unfettered access and freedom to operate in our domain uh, in order to not only advance national security, but also economic prosperity and scientific knowledge for the nation. And so that drove those two strategy documents early in the administration, um, which then a natural leap to if it was important enough to highlight a vital national interest and to highlight a security challenge and to develop national strategies to address it, then why not have a combatant command focused on warfighting in the domain and a separate and independent service designed to organize, train and equip uh, our military space forces uh, to be able to support all of our national needs and objectives. And so, um, you know, really there was a recognition that um, not only national security, but commercial and civil aspects of space all interrelate together. There are very few things that we do um, in the U.S. Space Force that are not related to uh, civil and commercial space. At the, at the end of the day, we all operate in the same domain. Uh, there's a lot of ongoing coordination and cooperation uh, in many different fora. Uh, and so we really wanted to be able to capture that close relationship in this doctrine document. You know, the intent of the SCP is to provide specifics on military space power, but we start with uh, highlighting the uniqueness of our operating of our domain, the space domain, uh, because that's critical to how we organize, train, and equip. And then we move on to what is military space power's contributions to national space power. And I think that's what drove this question, um, likely. And so we we talked to how we're one contributor uh, to uh, national leadership and to uh, meeting national objectives. The idea was that this doctrine document would not only highlight for every space force member. Uh, what their critical role in the Space Force, as well as what their critical contributions to the nation are. Um, but it also highlights for all other uh, space professionals in other organizations, whether they be US-based, whether they be um, international allies and partners. We want them to understand how we view space power from a military perspective. Uh, so that they have a good understanding and then we can partner together, continue to partner together, uh, because that's really the only way any of us are going to succeed in the domain. Um, with that, I'll pause and see if Colonel Beard or uh, Major Groslin have anything else to add. So I'll, I'll just uh, amplify very quickly as we look at this, and this, uh, Hippie, this is a theme that you'll probably see in several of our uh, responses uh, today, um, is that as a capstone document, foundational document, it, it ultimately exists to provide the purpose, identity, and culture of that institution of the organization, in this case, the Space Force. Uh, and so the other key word here is the fact that it's inaugural, right? And so as we're trying to establish our purpose, identity, and culture, it has to be put within a larger framework. And so the, the emphasis on national space power in chapter two was to set the stage, as General Corey mentioned, for our space professionals to know how do we contribute to the larger national interests, national objectives, to realize that we are part of a larger uh, contingent, if you will, that goes after that uh, that missionary and the domain itself. So that was that was ultimately the rationale there. It's an introductory concept that will continue to be expanded, matured over time, uh, and may or may not be in future iterations of this of this document. But we needed a starting point, a guidepost, if you will, to then expand this uh, this doctrinal concept. Colonel Wolf, just to, to add on that, um, one of the, the new terms that SCP does incorporate into the doctrine is this idea of, of unified space action. Um, and that's, um, the, that, that's the importance of collaborating with civil, commercial, and intelligence community partners. Um, but the document makes very clear that it's, it's more than just deconfliction. Um, it's a level of integration with all these different space programs in the United States that mutually reinforces the prosperity and the security of the nation. Um, and that, that's really the essence of the, um, the national space power and the role that military space power um, plays in that, that SCP tries to highlight. Thank you all for that response. And, and I really appreciate General LaCorey talking about, and, and even Major Grazan talking about the synchronization that needs to take place uh, across the domain, across the service, uh, leveraging our civil partners and, and even industry partners. And that leads me to a, a question for you, Colonel Beard. The Space Force leadership has re recently spoken about the need to leverage industry 
to develop the capabilities required to mature the Space Force as a virtual force, meaning the service needs to plan to use existing infrastructure currently in real estate and therefore must continue to mature and develop as a virtual interconnected entity. A virtual force is not a new concept, but certainly an immature one. What are the doctrinal implications for developing a virtual force and how are they captured in the space capstone? Sure, uh, another great question. Uh, and again, uh, apropos for, for the audience as well, uh, to be able to hear this and understand uh, where, where they fit uh, into this, uh, this idea. So, so to answer it, I would start with a few basic concepts uh, of space operations, um, space warfare, if you will, and then explain how a virtual force may enable those. And, and these concepts uh, are so basic that we decided to put them up into some of the original guiding principles at the front uh, of the document. Uh, the first of those is that space operations um, and, and by extension, space warfare is inherently global. Um, so because of that, the Space Force must rapidly integrate, synchronize, geographically separated, potentially disparate uh, entities and functions to accomplish our day-to-day -day mission, let alone combat operations. So there's, there's one piece just to keep in the back of our mind that, that are inherently global. Uh, the other factor that we also want to highlight is they're, that they're also inherently multi-domain. So if you look at a basic space architecture, we have a ground segment, terrestrial segment, we have the RF spectrum or EMS, electromagnetic spectrum, and the space segment. So the need to be able to conduct operations and assured operations uh, requires us to have defensive operations that are integrated and synchronized across all three of those segments. For example, if, if we lose access to one segment, one of the three, we've essentially lost access to space and we fail to achieve our national interest. So when we talk about a, a virtual force, if you will, the attributes of a virtual force, and we also highlight this toward the end now of, of SCP, um, in, the, in the midst of being able to execute this, in the midst of a dynamic, rapidly evolving strategic and operational environment, um, the Space Force itself and our members have to be agile, innovative, and bold. It, and, and having a virtual force, having a virtual capability uh, enables that way of doing business uh, and, and ultimately our ability to conduct global multi-domain operations. And there's a little bit of an irony there too, and it's kind of a self-reinforcing concept, is that our ability to be and even conceive of ourselves as a virtual force is predicated on the availability of space power, right? We are enabling ourselves to be a virtual entity. So it's, it's in our best interest to preserve those capabilities just to be able to operate in the way that we want to. And that's true across the joint force. It is a truly new way of warfare and to conceive of that because of that reality. And General Corey or, or Slash, if you have anything else to add there too. No, I, I think you nailed it. <laughs> Good, thank you, Colonel Beard. I really appreciate that. Uh, speaking of bold, let's go to Major Roslin. Sir, space superiority is an extension of the concept of air superiority from air power theory and air force doctrine. The space capstone publication yeah, defines space superiority questions. but does not explore the concept in depth. How important is the concept of space purity to the Space Force? How do the core competencies in the doctrine contribute to providing space superiority when required to support national security objectives? And I'll pause there. Yeah, so um, the team wrestled with terms like space superiority, space control, and counter space extensively. And this is one of those many areas where the feedback we got from joint coalition and intelligence community partners was invaluable. And um, at the end of that, that discussion, um, SCP reflects the fact that space superiority is an inescapable component of military space power because the essence of military space power is the contested nature of the space domain and space superiority is the competitive index. It's the scoreboard for that, that competition. Um, as a concept, it answers um, um, which side gains an advantage because of their ability to employ space capabilities. Now, we, uh, we went down the path of detailing how you would measure and assess space superiority, but that turned out to be quite difficult. Um, you know, how you measure and define space superiority, it'll vary from one conflict to the next um, based on the strategic objectives, and it'll also vary within a conflict as operational objectives um, evolve. And so because of all those operational nuances, we decided that it was best to defer 
um, a detailed discussion of measuring and assessing space superiority uh, to an operational level doctrine document and let um, SCP sharpen its focus on the purpose, identity, and culture of military space forces. No, thank you, Slash. A follow-up, space supremacy, that's a term that is not mentioned in the document, but has roots in warfare doctrine, obviously. Can you elaborate on why this edition did not pursue the term? And if we are to be fluent in the art of war, as stated, might supremacy be considered? Yeah, so um, yeah, space supremacy is in there just very vaguely. Um, space control and counter space are also missing from the document, right? So there, these, are, these are very prominent terms um, for anyone who's read historic uh, military space doctrine that were just omitted. Um, and, you know, the, the original draft that, that, that we produced, it, it had these terms in there, um, but they carry a lot of baggage, right? So if you take something like space control, in the context of military theory, it means one thing, but over the last 20 to 30 years of space operations, it's, mean, it's meant something else. And then space control also means something else entirely if you're in a security classification setting or a policy setting. And so all of that ambiguity made it very difficult to define the concepts of space control in a way that was clear and precise. Um, and so we had senior mentors, um, General Accord was one of them who encouraged us to cut any term that didn't directly contribute to the, the clarity of the document. And ultimately the team felt that by removing terms like space control and counter space and kind of downplaying this idea of space supremacy, um, that the, um, we could um, remove some ambiguity that it's kind of been an albatross around the neck of our community for a while. Um, but we could also put together doctrine that better aligns with joint concepts that currently exist um, and also explain the ideas in SCP in a clearer and more precise way by avoiding some of those preconceived notions that those legacy terms carried with us, with, uh, with them. Hey, if, I, if I could just amplify one thing, uh, you know, I think um, uh, Kenny highlighted the reasons why the team wrestled with some of these other terms that many of us are familiar with and have grown up with, uh, and ultimately why they decided to leave them out. And, and, and what I want to highlight there is I think that's a perfect example and a, and a personification by the original team of being innovative and bold two things that Chief Raymond uh, has said from the very beginning are, are, are things that we value in the service. Um, we've always valued them in the community, but this service is going to value agility, innovation, and boldness. And by being willing to step away from some of the traditional terms and be more clear uh, in our initial doctrine document, this team really exemplified that before we had even codified agility, innovation, and boldness within the document. Uh, you know, it would be very easy for this team uh, in their work and, and any of the other things that the Space Force goes and do, does to just take what already exists and swap patches and, and things like that. But that's not going to create the service that the nation needs. The, the nation made a, a significant decision um, between the president and Congress um, saying we need to have a separate independent service to be stewards of this domain that is of vital national importance to our country. And so we owe it to them uh, to be able to think um, innovative and to think bold as we start down this path uh, on the first, really the first year of our service. I actually got something else to add because this is a this is a key central component of a, of our discussion here, right? When you, especially when you talk about the purpose of military space power, as uh, Kenny had to hit on too. So the other, uh, just to give you and the and your audience a little bit of insight into some of the some of the discussions and debates that were being had regarding space superiority, because it applies to other domains as well. So when we look at the first core responsibility of military space power, that's the preservation and freedom of action, to preserve freedom of action in the domain. And then when we start looking at existing doctrinal definitions of domain superiority, and I'm paraphrasing here, they essentially say that superiority in any domain is our ability to operate freely without 
prohibited interference. And that's the extent of the idea. To us, what was missing in that definition is a, is a description of, or the need to attain a relative advantage against the adversary. So if we leave it to the fact or to the point where we can do what we want to do without prohibitive interference, we've got freedom of action uh, secured, but that has nothing to do with being able to gain the initiative or potentially, if needed, deny the adversary their ability to maneuver freely in the domain to achieve our objectives. So we felt that that idea of superiority in other domains may be lacking that second component of being able to have that relative advantage. Um, and, and that was really the essence of the dialogue and debate that we had uh, as we were defining it for us. No, that, I appreciate that amplification, Colonel Beard. And it's funny, when I was a space aggressor years ago, we would never talk about a on-orbit or direct ascent ASAT threat. And here, General Raymond is just a couple weeks ago talking about a ASAT test that's going on, ongoing. And thank goodness this doctrine's being discussed because we've got to be prepared. The Space Force must be prepared to achieve the, the U.S. space superiority mission, regardless of that threat. And so I'm so glad as, as when I was an aggressor, we only focused on a terrestrial threat and that, that ground-based threat. Uh, but now you all are defining the opportunity to discuss an on-orbit threat and actually talk about that and keeping the adversary right at the forefront. And, and so I really appreciate that. You talk about uh, the iteration of this, and, and we got a question from one of the audience members, uh, SFA member, Lieutenant Cohen Williams, out there doing his uh, advanced research. Uh, and he's got a question about how often this document can be rewritten. He, he, he says, while the document was a justification for the Space Force within modern DOD environment and contain, contains bold statements toward domain warfare, advocating peace, et cetera, how do you see this document evolving over the next decade or two? And is the four-year review period too long? That's a, that's a great question. Um, uh, tell me again what the person's name was that asked. It, it really, just because yeah, I want to recognize him for a great question. <laughs> yeah, L Lieutenant Cohen Williams. He just graduated from the Air great. Force Academy, and he's one of the one of the cadets who went right into the Space Force. Awesome. Well, then let me start with congratulations on the commissioning and and joining the Space Force. Um, a, a great question, and I think you're right on the money with hey, thinking about is four years too long. As a matter of fact, this team, uh, as well as probably a group of a couple hundred others, uh, participated in a. Uh, uh, Space Warfighting Doctrine Summit here in uh, Colorado Springs back in the uh, late July or late January, early February. And one of the topics of conversation in that doctrine summit was um, how often should our doctrine be updated and what's the doctrine hierarchy look like? The, the team recognized early on that, you know, ideally your capstone doctrine is not something that's going to change every other week or, or, or each year. However, as the inaugural document, we fully expect it will change more often in the early years of our service. As a matter of fact, Chief Raymond highlights in his foreword um, that really what he wants folks to do is exactly what Colin has done and engage with the document, read it, um, critique the ideas, debate the ideas, and bring forward uh, new ideas to make it better. You know, where the Air Force started 70 plus years ago on air doctrine is certainly not where we are today. And we think the same thing is gonna happen for the Space Force. And so we may see this doctrine document, the SCP, uh, be updated more often in the beginning and then settle into where this is the document that maybe gets updated as, I, as it talks about every four years. Uh, and then some of the, the uh, subordinate doctrine documents at the operational level and the tactical level, those will be updated on a much more regular basis. I guess the other thing I would tie in here, you asked about the virtual service um, earlier. Uh, that's one of the things that the Doctrine Summit discussed was, hey, we need to find more um, innovative ways to update our doctrine. And so we're exploring ways to, to use wiki type environments where um, those that are wrestling with the tactics, techniques, and procedures in any of our different warfighting disciplines can really engage in an online environment to be able to allow us to update some of our subordinate uh, doctrine at the tactical and operational level much more often. So I think it's a great question by Colin. And if uh, Casey or Kenny think I left anything out, please feel free to uh, add on. Look forward to meeting you on active duty, Colin. Thank you. Thank you for that question. 
Uh, Lieutenant Williams, appreciate that, and thank you for the response. General Corey, over to you. The new doctrine discusses the importance of enabling joint lethality and effectiveness, and the importance of the Space Force providing independent military options in, from, and to the space domain. Currently, the Space Force only provides the space capabilities transferred from the Air Force. The National Reconnaissance Office and specific missile defense systems in the Army, Ground Base Interceptor, and Navy SM-3 provide independent options which can or do create kinetic effects in the space domain. Does this new doctrine imply there is intent to bring those capabilities into the Space Force? And if not, is it possible the Space Force will continue to work with SECDEF to acquire those capabilities as part of its capabilities to provide independent military options in the warfighting domain it is responsible for? Yeah, so um, uh, uh, wonderful question. Let me start with, there's no intent in this doctrine document to imply the Space Force taking over additional uh, capabilities that exist in other organizations. Um, as a matter of fact, that some of the organizations that you've listed um, have been and will continue to be important partners for us uh, as we continue to evolve um, what it is that we do in the domain. Now, there are ongoing conversations, as many on the, on the webinar may be aware, uh, between Chief Raymond, Secretary of the Air Force, Secretary of Defense, the other service chiefs, about where are the best places that the U.S. Space Force can support those organizations, as well as what capabilities do those organizations have that may make sense to bring into the, into the Space Force. The doctrine document itself is not designed to, to make a case that some of those should or shouldn't be. That's something that'll get worked with those senior leaders uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and out and about. Um, but the reality for us all is that warfare now and in the future is going to be multi-domain and it's going to involve capabilities that uh, generate uh, or initiate from all domains and have effects in other domains. And so um, that's a conversation that'll continue to go on. But uh, the direct answer to the question is the doctrine document itself was not intended to imply any uh, ownership or transfer of ownership. Yes, sir, understand. I think a lot of people have that convert they're thinking about that uh as a new service stands up you know what assets are going to be brought over and i'm sure uh, probably plenty of opportunity for delta leadership to define some of those war fighting capabilities and then to your point about the ttp development uh, even more of an opportunity to allow tacticians to describe their force requirements really uh, and then identify what those requirements are to fill those capability gaps that we know exists in our current force structure. So, no, I, I really do appreciate that, sir. Uh, we've got, uh, let's see, Colonel Beard. Uh, space mobility and logistics. This is a this is a big deal. Uh, I mean, especially as you talk about attrition and it's, the logistics are talked about in every other service all the time. So it just makes sense that the Space Force would start talking about logistics. Uh, from that concept, how do you bring together traditional space lift concepts with further reaching concepts developed over the past 20 years from operational responsive space lift to delivering capabilities through the space domain to surface domains? Can you comment on how important it is to the future joint force for the space force to develop and mature capabilities to provide space mobility and logistics presented in this doctrine? Sure, sure. Um, so, so put simply, Right, as, as one of the five core competencies. Uh, SMNL, Space Mobility and Logistics, right? It's essential to achieving those core competencies. So, so just as a matter of course, it's essential that the Space Force continues to develop and mature these concepts. Um, the domain will only become more complex and dynamic over time, right? And so, so the need to rapidly deploy, reconstitute, recover, sustain space-based capabilities is only gonna increase with that complexity. So just, just from a joint force perspective, our ability to continue to access the domain regardless uh, of what threats or what challenges we face is an imperative uh, for national defense and national security. And of course, the projection and employment of space power. Um, so that's how I would answer that, that immediate question. I don't know if you have any follow-ups to that, but um, it, it's fundamental that we invest uh, in those capabilities and concepts um, now in anticipation of a more complex environment. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. Sure. Is the Space Force ready to provide space mobility and logistics as explained in the doctrine, or is the concept more aspirational? Sure. And if you, yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so on that, I, I would say that um, the DOD has provided the um, the core element of space mobility in, of log in logistics, if I can if I can spit that out, uh, in the form of space launch for decades, right? And and the space force has certainly inherited that and has already had tremendous success in its in its short uh, existence uh, from that standpoint, and will continue to do that. But the broader concepts that we outline uh, in the SCP, such as on-orbit servicing um, or uh, assuring access to space via multiple and varied launch locations and platforms, those are uh, those are a little less matured. But but I wouldn't necessarily use the term aspirational in terms of foundational doctrine. The, the word I would use in it, and I don't believe this is a, a difference without a distinction. I, I would use it more as a framework. We're setting the framework and the vision for what this force needs to have available to it to be able to apply the concepts throughout the document itself. So as I mentioned earlier, space mobility and logistics as described in SCP is a requisite for preserving freedom of action in space, for enabling joint lethality and effectiveness and for providing independent options. Um, so again, um, I, I understand the idea that it's aspirational maybe in the sense that we don't have them, but it's a little bit more uh, focused than aspirational in the sense that this is what we need to pursue to achieve uh, the ends that we intend. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. We got a question here in the Q&A chat from squadron leader Mark Buckers Buckley. From the former exchange officer to Air Force Base Command and now officer commanding operations at RAF Flyingdales in the UK. General Corey, the question's for you. What do you think the key takeaways of the new publication are for coalition partners? Yeah, so first of all, uh, Buckers, glad to have you on the net. Uh, we miss you here uh, in uh, Building One. Um, Buckers is one of many uh, incredibly talented and, and critical allies that we have working side by side with us in all of the different Space Force locations. Uh, and, and congratulations on the new job. Um, I would say I'll go back to where I started. You know, there's multiple audiences that the SCP is intended for. Certainly one of the primaries is all of our Space Force members. Um, and, and we certainly consider um, those exchange officers and LNOs that are working alongside of us part of that group. But to the point of the question, the larger group of allies uh, in, in all the other various countries that we partner with, what we really wanted to do here was to highlight what the U.S.'s newest service in 72 years viewed as important. We, we highlight kind of the big three, if you will, the, the cornerstone responsibilities, our core competencies, and then our space power disciplines. And we wanted all of our allies and partners to recognize how we thought about those things. They're really the, the why, the how, and the who uh, that surround our service. We wanted our allies and partners to understand um, how we were evolving some of these concepts and the discussions that we had earlier about um, what I'll call traditional space power terms and how we're evolving those. Um, and, you know, as uh, Chief Raymond has done uh, for a long time in many of his roles, um, you know, our partnership with our allies has been critical to our success. And so one of the things that uh, he did as a part of this rollout was uh, he had uh, General Shaw at Vandenberg actually uh, send a, uh, an early copy to uh, um, many of our allies and partners as a part of the CSPO effort um, so that they could get a chance to see those before it was published. Uh, and so I think that's really what it's all about is to take yet another step to strengthen that partnership because there's no way that any of us um, succeed in the domain without each other. Uh, and so the best way to do that is to be transparent about how we're thinking about things as a service and then to engage with our allies and partners uh, as we evolve this. You know, I mentioned the Doctrine Summit uh, earlier this year. We had several of our allies and partners as a part of that. Um, and so, you know, to get some early thoughts from them to help shape this before it was published. And, and I would envision that dialogue to continue uh, for a long time. Uh, and we'll use the SCP as the basis for that. Um, but I certainly would expect that the operational and tactical level doctrine documents are other things that we will share to kind of continue that dialogue with our allies and partners. So great question, Buckers, and I hope everything's going well for you and your family uh, back in the UK. Thank you, sir. This one, uh, I, got a, I got another question online. This one is from a Colonel retired Joker Jackson. And, you know, his experience as a director of Space Forces out there in absent for a year, he always, I think, battled with 
you know, how do we, what are the authorities given to the other services and how do we balance that? So his question is, how will military space leaders balance domain war fighting and inherent authorities to protect and defend in the space domain against the designated functional and geographic com commanders who expect military space platforms to meet vital operational needs? I know that's, that's a big one, but you, you know Joker. So I'll pause there for the panel. Okay. Incredibly insightful question uh, as usual. So the first thing I'll do is nuance it a little bit. Um, I think the words you use, and I don't know if they're yours or his, and it doesn't matter, but was to balance against. And I would say balance with is, is how I would nuance that. But um, there's a lot of things going on right now to uh, try to evolve uh, where many of us uh, have been during our deployed times, um, leading planning or, or operations on the space side out. So I'll start and then you guys please feel free to chime in. But, um, you know, the fact that we have now a combatant command uh, established who is responsible for a defined area of responsibility uh, is a big first step. And so they are about to, U.S. Space Command is about to celebrate its first birthday. Uh, here in the not too distant future. And um, at least in the beginning, one of the things that US Space Command um, set out to do was to establish integrated planning elements with each of the other combatant commands, which would consist of US Space Command personnel um, embedded with the other combatant commands to help with that balancing that, uh, that Joker is talking about there. Um, and so there are some of those that are established right now We've, they actually, in the very first uh, global lightning, global thunder exercise that U.S. Space Command participated in as a new combatant command, uh, we worked with, uh, well, I shouldn't say we, but U.S. Space Command worked with U.S. European Command uh, in uh, in concert. Uh, and I, what, uh, what we saw was a lot of benefit from being able to integrate the planning battle rhythm for the terrestrial and other domains in U.S. European Command and the planning and battle rhythm for General Raymond as the commander of U.S. Space Command uh, to be able to synchronize those effects. You know, the reality of warfare going forward, again, is that we're going to be multi-domain through and through. And so we're going to be able, to, we're going to need uh, to be able to coordinate those effects um, both in our domain and from our domain and to our domain. And that's going to require continued dialogue. I, I believe that uh, General Shaw in his capacity at Vandenberg right now is also working for uh, General Raymond in both hats, in U.S. Space Command and as Chief Raymond, um, how it is that the service will present um, forces uh, forward. And so I would say look in the coming year for uh, some additional thoughts on presentation of forces and, and how that will work. It's probably a little early to, uh, to highlight um, something that's been decided or that is successful, but uh, I would look for that as both the combatant command and the service continue to evolve. And I don't know if either one, uh, one of you want to add into that. But. Sir, I'll just, I'll just add um, from a protect and defense standpoint, right, from a Delta-9 or orbital warfare standpoint, if you will. Um, the, what, what I hear uh, General Corey saying and what resonates with me completely is this idea um, between the services and the joint force to be able to synchronize our schemes of maneuver, right? So as I'm conducting protect and defend operations on orbit um, with those, from example, from Space Delta-8 or MILSATCOM PNT or Delta Space Delta-4 missile warning, uh, we need to understand how those assets are supporting theater operations and the timing and tempo of those to be able to again synchronize our forces and array them in a way that is able to ensure those capabilities are provided when needed right and so i think this this stand-up for example of space delta 9 will allow us to force that conversation to understand how are our taskings conducted again in timing and tempo and synchronized with theater operations I'd be remiss if I didn't also include the fact that as part of the U.S. Space Command stand-up, they established the Joint Task Force for Space Defense, and the National Space Defense Center basically rolled into um, U.S. Space Command. It existed as the JIXBOC prior to that, but that organization and that op center are specifically designed for that protect and defend mission. So there is going to need to be close coordination with that op center responsible for protecting and defending in the domain with the other operations center at Vandenberg, the Combined Space Operations Center and our, our C2 Delta there, designed to uh, ensure space effects are being delivered uh, in the timing and tempo that are needed in other theaters, uh, as well as that coordination with the other combatant commands that the, uh, that the question alluded to. Major Groslin, anything to add there? 
So I, I will just say that um, I did work for that Joker when he was a Dirt Space 4. So he probably knows exactly what I'm going to say with my response, but I'll go ahead and share. Um, you know, I think that the Space Force having a robust doctrine system um, is an important step, not just in developing joint smart space warfighters, but also space smart joint warfighters, right? By, by publishing doctrine and being open about it, um, you make it abundantly clear and accessible and easy for your joint partners to understand everything that, that you're working through. And then at the same time, um, what your requirements are um, and share those back and forth. Um, so, you know, when I was out there at Ascent with, with Colonel Jackson, um, one of the things that was, was hammered into us uh, by both him and the deputy DS4 was the importance of understanding joint and service doctrine of the other services so that we could anticipate their requirements understand their command and control structures and then integrate appropriately uh, through that. And I think that space capstone publication and then the doctrine that falls out of that as the Space Force flushes out that doctrine tree um, is gonna go a long way in developing um, that understanding. Thank you, Slash, appreciate that. You know, we are in a time that standing up the service is completely different than the last time we started, stood up a service back in, in 46 and 47. Uh, coming off of World War II, the, the culture was understood because all the Army Air Corps folks had deployed 400,000 plus strong. They knew what the mission was because they experienced it firsthand. They went in, they, they, they accomplished their, their missions, and then they came home. And they debriefed and they said, hey, this, this is the capabilities we need to do our job. Fast forward to today, it's a lot different perspective nowadays. I mean, we talked about the virtual requirement. And so what, Major Grazan, what are your, what's your opinion as kind of the, the tactician on the line of developing what you know needs to be discussed, which is a space warfighting culture and the masters of space, and as masters of space shape or contribute to the development of Space Force culture, how does Space Force senior leaders see the concept shaping or contributing to the development of Space Force? And I say Space Force senior leaders, how do you see these concepts shaping or contributing to the development of the Space Force culture? Yeah, so uh, what I will say is from the beginning, the team recognized that one of the most important tasks was to connect the concept of space power with the purpose, identity, and culture of military space forces. Now, to do that, the team settled on this duality that blends an excitement for orbital flight with the grave and crucial responsibilities of a warfighter community. You know, on one hand, military space professionals share a kindred spirit with the pioneers who have propelled humanity into space and towards the stars. And, and our community shares in that heritage. And who doesn't get excited when NASA or a commercial company like SpaceX does something that's truly amazing or groundbreaking in space? Um, space Force is going to have its share of those moments in the future. And that's really what mastery of space refers to, that, that kindred spirit with all the other space pioneers. But on the other hand, all warfighting cultures are adversary-centric and they fuel a tenacious fighting spirit to outwit, outmaneuver, and dominate any adversary. And our, our senior leaders um, have made it clear that the Space Force is gonna be no different. Um, and that's the, that's the war fighting component. Um, so chapter five in SCP, it attempts to blend these two distinct heritages in a way that can lay a foundation for a, a singular service culture um, that has both of those components. I'll pause there and see if there's any additional comments from either General Corey or Colonel Beard. Um, what I would say on the warfighting piece, because that that is actually baked into the way we think about it at Delta Nine as well, this idea of tenacity, right? The grit that you need uh, to be able to execute a warfighting type mission. Um, there, there's an interesting anecdote to this about how do we how do we instill that or inculcate that into our space professionals, right? Uh, and, and part of that is this idea of the risk taking or the boldness that we talked about before. And what is the right level of risk? Where can that be assumed, and how can that be assumed? Uh, and so, 
one example of how we would want to continue to instill that in our folks can be found in the way we do training in the standards we set, the qualification standards and expectations we have for our crew members down, down at the, the initial level, entry level. Um, and so we would even intend to be able to present them, you know, in a, in a safe, secure environment, if you will, training environment, with very difficult, almost unwinnable scenarios to see how they think on their feet. Are they able to make hard decisions with limited information? Or how do they integrate and work with one another to solve those problems on tactically relevant timelines? And we would also bake that into, our, like I mentioned before, qualification standards. Are they meeting the basic uh, entry level understanding to be able to and, and demonstrate the skills to be able to operate in a very fluid uh, uh, information deprived environment? And that in and of itself starts to feed this culture of warfare, war fighting and a demand signal to the larger community to be able to empower them to make the decisions they need. Fight. So, so all of those types of conversations also kind of were in the in the background uh, as we developed uh, these chapters as well and discussed them as a team. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll, I'll add two things. So you started the question by alluding to uh, how things are so mu are so much different now than uh, seventy plus years ago as the Air Force was coming into its own, and and I would say there's there's absolutely plenty of truth to that. You, you could spend another hour talking about all the things that have happened that are different now. But there is some similarity there. Uh, you know, the, the Air Force came about as a separate service by, um, you know, their experience, our experience in the air domain from World War One to World War II. Um, and so really the Air Force as it stood up, stood on the shoulders of many air power pioneers uh, that were there it's no different for us, right? It's not like December of last year was all of a sudden now that now, you know, was our first time in space. We've been, we stand here, we sit here and stand here on the shoulders of many space power pioneers um, that have been a part of our history um, all along since we uh, first started operating in the domain. And so it's important for us to recognize that. Um, and at the same time, take the responsibility of that mantle being handed over to say, now it's time to create a separate and independent service and lean on the things that it makes sense to lean on, but then evolve and innovate um, to where we really need to be from a separate service perspective. And the other nuance I, I just wanted to highlight, so both uh, Kenny and, and Casey highlighted, um, you know, the importance of that war fighting culture and that war fighting aspect. And that is absolute, we, we have to have that, you know, what, what I usually describe as what Lieutenant LaQuarrie needed to be thinking about uh, as a space operator in the third space ops squadron um, many moons ago is far different than what we need our operators trained and thinking about today. Um, having said that, nobody wants um, conflict to move into space um, less than we do as operators in the domain, right? Really, all of us would prefer that conflict did not extend into the domain. You know, it, it, I think as our current vice chairman, uh, General Hyten, who first sort of said, you know, really, there's no such thing as space war, there's just war. And we would really like that our role in this is helping to prevent conflict and war from extending into the domain. But we recognize that the absolute best way to prevent that from happening is to prepare for that conflict uh, in the event that it did happen and ideally prepare to an extent that convinces potential adversaries that they're not going to get the benefits uh, that they perceive by bringing conflict into the space domain. Perfect, thank you, sir, I appreciate that. In the interest of time, I know we're, we're winding down here on our hour and I wanna just say thanks to all the attendees who came online today to listen to this discussion. I obviously want to want to thank the SAF PA and US Space Force PA office for helping to set this up because without them, we would not have been able to do this. So thanks so much to, to those teams over there and your teams there. And of course, to um, you, sir, General LaCorey and Colonel Beard and, and Major Groslin, thanks so much for your time. Are there any closing comments you'd like to just kind of tell the audience about the space doctrine? Yeah, sure. I'll start and say that I think this exchange today on the webinar is exactly the type of thing that the original authors wanted and certainly our chief want is that we've published this doctrine document now. 
it's the capstone. It's the inaugural, as uh, Colonel Beard highlighted. Uh, and now it's time to, to wrestle with and debate the ideas and the concepts in the capstone document or document and then move into the subordinate doctrine uh, documents. And, and so uh, thank you to the Space Force Association, your sponsors, uh, for allowing us this opportunity to have some of that engagement uh, with, a, with a broad audience. Um, and then I, I'd like to close with just a couple other thank yous. Again, thank you to the original uh, authors and, and to all the mentors that contributed uh, to the team. The reality is that's another set of people that were standing on their shoulders to have this doctrine document published here in the eighth month of our service. If you think about it, you know, really it's, it's early on, but we've got a solid document to, to set that foundation. And I'll, and I'll throw out uh, some thanks to the uh, team here at, uh, at headquarters U.S. Space Force that did the editing on the document as the authors handed it off for kind of formal cord. Uh, there's a team here that has uh, done a lot of that. And lastly, uh, two individuals, Mr. Funkhauser and Mr. Seppi, uh, who were critical to us being able to publish this hard copy version in what is a really quick fashion um, because you know we, we continued to wrestle with the ideas. We finally got it finalized. And then of course, once it's there, there's an excitement that says, when can we put it out? When can we publish it? And so those two individuals uh, did yeoman's work to be able to get this thing uh, published in the span of about a week after we had it finalized uh, so that uh, Chief Raymond could take it over to the Hill. Chief Raymond could share it with our allies and partners and Chief Raymond could share it with our uh, DOD and Air Force leadership uh, as well. So so uh, thanks to all of those that were a part of making this uh, reality. Uh, and, and again, appreciate the opportunity to talk about it today. Thanks, sir. Uh, again, uh, Hippie and SFA, uh, thanks for the venue. Thanks for the opportunity for us to, to tell the story and to answer the questions. And I know more will come. So again, in, in that spirit of debate, uh, refinement, and improvement, this is exactly what we need to be doing. Um, two other comments I would make very quickly, and I'm going to, I'm going to go refer back to the lieutenant. I believe you said his name was Lieutenant Cohen Williams that asked the question, if I have that right? That's correct. Uh, so so for Lieutenant Williams and his counterparts, the, the brand brand new CGOs and NCOs, uh, airmen uh, in the Space Force, this document is your document, right? What we're trying to produce here are space power advocates. You now have the ability and a tool in hand, and, and, and Kenny was alluding to this as well about building uh, space smart uh, professionals here, war fighters. To, to read, to digest, to internalize, and to go out to the joint force with confidence as you sit around the, the planning tables, as you sit around in theater, to be the expert that the DOD expects you to be. No one else is responsible for space power now that we have the space, other than the space force. That's why we exist. So be confident, be encouraged, be, be empowered by saying, I know what I contribute to the fight and I'm willing to step forward and lead in that capacity with my joint counterpart. So, so I want to encourage you to do that. The second piece, I'm going to make a, 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 shame, a shameless uh, plug here that Delta Nine's hiring. So Lieutenant uh, <laughs> Williams, uh, we'll take you if you want to come our way. IQT starts uh, very soon. <clears throat> so uh, great question on that. And, and for just again, the broader, broader team, broader dialogue. Again, I can't, uh, I, I can't say enough thanks and gratitude uh, to the mentors, to the team, uh, the original 22 that uh, poured a blood, sweat and tears into producing the document. And then ultimately, um, you know, for the larger Space Force itself, uh, to the empowerment that we felt in being able to do this, to take this idea and make it a reality. Um, I want that to be a good news story for the service and uh, an example or, or an exemplar, I should say, for how we do business. So others in the field, as you continue to have your ideas at a tactical level, we'll make sure that you have the venues and the forums in place to get your thoughts heard, refined, uh, validated, if you will, and, and actually put into action. So uh, it's a great new story all around. Thanks again. It, just uh, to pile on from the previous two comments, you know, a common complaint with doctrine, um, any military doctrine, is that it quickly becomes sterile or antiquated. And if we want to prevent that from happening to our doctrine and our community, the only way we do that is through healthy, lively, and critical debate. And so I want to thank the Space Force Association for, for starting that process, and, and hopefully there's much more of it to come in the future. On behalf of the entire Space Force Association, I'd like to just offer a just tremendous amount of gratitude for everyone taking their time, taking time out of their busy schedules today to talk about this, this 
defining moment for the Space Force in this doctrine. I'd like to again thank our corporate members, Braxton Technologies, Boresight LLC, AGI, and Numerica. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do events like this. We look forward to upcoming events in the near future to continue this dialogue. So thanks again to General LaCorey, Colonel Beard, and Major Grothlin, and look forward to future conversations. Have a great day. Semper Supra. Semper Supra. Thanks again. Appreciate it.